Apple says that the basic iPad is its most popular tablet. Now in its ninth generation though, the form factor is starting to feel stale. It's basically unchanged from the iPad Air Apple released way back in 2013. Then again, for only $329, who cares? It's not a tablet meant for early adopters like me. It's for those who want a fast, lightweight tablet with a nice display and tons of apps. Without having to spend too much or consider whether a device like the iPad Pro is the future of computing. As such, there are just a few things to consider about Apple's latest iPad. If you have an old iPad, what's new and better about this one? And if you don't have an iPad, is this the one to buy? For starters, let's recap what's new about the 9th gen iPad compared to the model Apple introduced last year. The processor powering it is Apple's A13 Bionic chip, which first appeared in 2019 inside the iPhone 11. It's a year newer than the A12, which powered last year's iPad, and it's faster and more efficient than its predecessor. I experienced no noticeable slowdowns of any kind, whether I was multitasking between Slack, writing this review in Google Docs, juggling various tabs in Safari, or playing Apple Arcade games. Since this iPad has less RAM than the iPad Pro I use on a daily basis, I noticed that apps needed to refresh their content more frequently when I was doing a lot of multitasking. But everything was quick to load up and I was back on my way in no time. For most people's standard iPad use cases, browsing the web, editing photos, playing games, watching movies, messaging, drawing or taking notes with the Apple Pencil, writing emails or working on documents with the smart keyboard, the A13 Bionic is more than powerful enough. Another new thing about the 2021 iPad is you get double the storage for the same amount of money. That means the $329 iPad has 64GB of storage this year, while the $479 device comes with a healthy 256GB. As usual, you can also add LTE connectivity to these devices for an additional $130. This change is easy to evaluate. More storage is always better, and it was sorely needed, particularly on the base model. The iPad's 10.2 inch screen is unchanged, but for one new feature. It has Apple's True Tone technology for the first time which automatically adjusts the color temperature based on the ambient light in the room around you. Apple has offered this feature on more expensive iPads and all of its iPhones for years now, so it's nice to see it finally in use at the lower end. The display otherwise looks good whether you're watching videos, playing games, or browsing the web. It's not nearly as good as the screens on the other iPads that Apple sells, though. For a $329 device, it is perfectly usable, pleasant even. I did notice the air gap on the new iPad that comes from not having its display bonded to the glass, but I can accept that as a cost-cutting measure. Finally, Apple put a new front-facing camera on the new iPad, a sorely needed upgrade. It's the same as the one on the new iPad mini and the iPad Pro, minus all the depth sensors and extra hardware needed for Face ID. It's a 12 megapixel shooter with an extremely wide field of view. That wide angle enables a feature Apple calls center stage. When you're on a FaceTime call, the camera automatically crops in around you, rather than show the full 122 degree field of view. But since the camera has all those megapixels to work with, it'll follow you around as you move inside the frame. It's an interesting feature, though usually I'm stationary during video calls. I'm still just glad about the increased resolution. Everything else about the new iPad is unchanged. It is the same size and weight as the last two models and features the same screen size. It has the same largish bezels, 8 megapixel back camera, lightning port for charging, and home button with Touch ID built in. It works with the first generation Apple Pencil that Apple has offered since late 2015, and the same smart keyboard that Apple built for the 10.5 inch iPad Pro back in 2017. There are still two speakers at the bottom when you're holding the device in portrait orientation, which means audio still comes at you from one off-center spot when you're watching a video. But there's a headphone jack. As always, Apple says the iPad's battery lasts for 10 hours of browsing the web or watching videos over Wi-Fi. I got a little less than that when using the iPad and its keyboard for a full day of work, but the device did far surpass that estimate when I was watching videos. I got close to 14 hours before the battery finally kicked it. Naturally, you'll enjoy less runtime when you're doing more intensive tasks like gaming. Despite the older design and internal hardware, the user experience felt fresh. Thanks largely to iPad OS 15. Here's a few new things that stuck out to me. Quick Notes is a great feature for Apple Pencil users and makes the iPad a much better note-taking device. Obviously, it's handy to be able to summon a new note to scribble in whenever you want, but the fact that it also recognizes when you're on a website or specific map location and lets you save those things to the note is particularly useful. Apple initially made some controversial and unpopular design decisions for Safari in the iPad OS 15 beta, but they quickly reversed course and now that tabs work the way they should, I can appreciate some of the other changes this year to the browser. 
Tab groups are a convenient way to organize things when you want to separate out what you're browsing by category. I often use it to keep research for stories all in one place. And being able to find links that were shared with me through the Messages app right in Safari is super handy too. The variety of new multitasking gestures took a little getting used to, but they do make it easier to set up various spaces with the right combination of apps for what you're doing. The iPad's 10.2 inch screen is borderline too small for doing much in multitasking mode, but it's still useful to have a bunch of my most used apps a swipe away and slide over. And the new shelf that appears when you launch an app to show you other spaces the app is running in is another smart addition I've been using a lot. Other changes are taking me a little more time to set up the way I'd like. The notification summary feature, which lets you set up a time for notifications from specific apps to be delivered, is a clever idea in theory but I haven't yet fully figured out exactly what apps I want to relegate to the summary and which ones I want to show up immediately. Similarly, the new focus feature lets you set up multiple do not disturb scenarios. Each of them can have their own schedule, apps or people that are allowed or blocked, and home screens that are hidden or active. It's extremely flexible and customizable, but I haven't quite figured out how to make the most of it. Coming from the iPad Pro, I was pleasantly surprised at how capable the new iPad is. I've gotten used to using the Magic Keyboard and its trackpad for work on my iPad Pro, so I found the new iPad's smart keyboard folio without a trackpad a bit lacking. Between that and the smaller screen, it's not my first choice for tasks that required me to keep an eye on multiple things simultaneously. But it is a great device for drafting this review, plus all the iPad things I want to do when I'm not working. Honestly, I can do just about everything I can with my iPad Pro on the new iPad. There are a few slight changes and compromises here, but for the consumers Apple is targeting, those things might be moot. The iPad remains a very good tablet at a fair price. If you want something more modern, I don't blame you and would instead point you towards the iPad Air, which hits a sweet spot of performance, features, and price. But the new iPad is undeniably the best value in the company's lineup, which means it should keep its place as the most popular iPad. If you have an old iPad that's starting to feel sluggish, this new one should be a solid replacement. And if you've never had one before, this is the place to start.